Amazon, who is just an expert at how to work with a board and implementing EOS. And we want to have a deep discussion on unboxing the owner's box. EOS is not designed for companies who have boards. We are privately held target market with 10 to 250 employees. However, what we are noticing in our market is that more and more companies that we work with have a board of some type. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. We did a, a poll uh, of the companies for implementers and 68% of companies running on EOS, in fact, do have boards. And so we have to address how to interact with leadership teams, boards of any type and how to best get on the same page and really execute well to achieve the outcomes that you want to achieve. So we're just going to have a conversation about that. It's meant to be a teaching and learning experience for those of you who are listening so that you can really navigate this the best way possible. And it's also important to note that as we see into the future, we're, we call it the great wealth transfer. And there's just all these businesses, I think it equates to over $10 trillion in asset value that are gonna go from the current founder, entrepreneur, owners to another ownership group. And I have to think that a lot of those are going to go to private equity funds and other ownership structures that will require a board of some type and they will most likely want them. So we have that, it's coming. And so we're gonna see more and more of this. And so we wanna address it right out front. So Patrick, thank you for agreeing to do this. I think it's just really important context for implementers and for clients running on EOS. So let's jump into it. Thanks, Mark. Really excited to do this. And um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, US is $10 trillion in transfer, but this is also happening across the world. Like I'm from Canada and we're talking about a $1 trillion transfer of uh, businesses and enterprises. And you talked about private equities buying into uh, these companies, but there's also a big surge in family offices. So businesses that have done really well and still want to invest money in businesses versus putting it in the stock market. So it's a, it's a growing trend for sure. Yeah. So let's, let's just dive in. And I think there's different types of boards that we want to talk about. There's different types of ownership structures that we want to talk about. And then how does that interact with EOS? Obviously EOS is owned by private equity and we've had our ups and downs with that structure and we really got to a good place now, but it took a lot of work where we had to create a process and a structure that we can work really well together. And so that's what we're going to take people through. So why don't you dive in Patrick and, and lead us through. Okay. Well, let me start with why am I doing this and actually how I got into EOS EOS before because I really started with governance and realized that a lot of businesses who wanted uh, either an advisory board or a board weren't ready for their governance and, and realized that I needed to help them with their strategic plan to be able to structure themselves, give them a direction, and then help them feed the board on where their gaps were and where they needed help. And my motivation comes from um, uh, 12 years ago, I, I joined a board, uh, an advisory board. Uh, two young guys, 35 years old, were uh, taking over their company, their parents' company. And basically, um, they, they really were ambitious and they were driven, but they knew that there were a lot of things they didn't know and they needed help to really address those things to be able to scale the company to the level they wanted. And um, when they, they approached me, they approached me to be kind of their marketing and technology uh, uh, advisor. And they took another five advisors on the board uh, for different reasons, for different roles and gaps, competency gaps, I call them, to really help them, you know, elevate themselves to their, their longer term objective. The, their ambition was to become the Canadian leader in their industry. And they were making about $60 million in revenue about 12 years ago. And uh, when we met them, they said, well, you know, guys, 
advisory board. We want to be the leader in our the Canadian space, and you know that's why we, we brought you here. We want your help to be able to get there. And we asked them, well, how big is the Canadian space? And they said, well, we don't know. So we said, well, you know, it'd be good to know uh, what, what the size of the space so that we know when you're a leader. So they said, well, great idea. Let us work on that. They came back two boards later, and they said, we know the space is a $5 billion space. So $60 million, we want to be a leader in a $5 billion space. So we told them, guys, if you want to be a leader, not the leader, but a leader in a $5 billion market, you need to own at least 20% of, um, of that space. And uh, they said, well, fine. Our 10-year target is a billion dollars now. Um, so they worked and they really focused on that. And today, 12 years later, they're over $2 billion in revenue. And uh, I was amazed. Like, I lived that journey and, you know, saw... Uh, the you know the the structure of the advisory board come to place and, and all, and when people ask them those those two those two brothers uh, what you know what was what, what was the key of their success, they tell people that you know what our advisory board was critical in us getting to where we are. I'd say they were driven and they they were really ambitious, but they they tell people without our advisory board we would have made mistakes. We wouldn't have gotten there as fast. Uh, we we learned, we grew, uh, we we got contacts that we would have never gotten, and I realized that the impact of an advisory board helping businesses surround themselves with the right people with the right competencies and the right structure to manage an advisory board could be highly impactful. So that's what got me to say, hey, I need to help businesses set up their advisory board, help them get the right advisors to really help them propulse themselves to the next level. As I started doing that, uh, I realized that a lot of businesses weren't ready. Uh, they, they wouldn't have been able to feed the advisory board in the proper way. And that's where I said, you know what, I really need to help them with their strategic planning, their structure, operationalizing the strategic plan. And that's where I discovered EOS. And I've been doing EOS to help these businesses prepare and get better and get better aligned. And then when they're ready, then I complement it with um, an advisory board or a governance structure. And we'll talk about the difference of the two later on in this podcast. Yeah. And what what comes up for me as you're describing that is my own experience. I was on a board in a company that I founded uh, eventually, you know, just kind of moved into the owner's box at some point, which is really the owner's box is what we describe that structure, if you will, of where advisory boards or boards of any type kind of sit. And having that experience for myself now, our board members ask all sorts of challenging questions. And it has created a world in where I am required to be much more diligent, much more intentional. I've got to have way more reasoning for my decision making than if I was just kind of going off and doing it myself. So I think that challenge, that friction, those questions really help a leader become the next version of themselves, the next best version of themselves. And it's just a, such a valuable function that exists just from the perspective of questioning your strategy, putting it under the microscope testing it out and you end up to be uh, a much better version of your, of yourself and the company grows as a result of that. So let's talk about the owner's box and the accountability chart. So we've got the, this owner's box that sits above the accountability chart. And when we're talking about accountability chart, we're talking about in EOS, the, the concept of the function, the seat, the roles, the leadership team, visionary, integrator, and leadership team members. And then we've got this owner's box. So let's kind of dive into the different types of structures that go into an owner's box. Who, who sits there? Yeah, so... Um... You know, as we develop the accountability chart, I, 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 especially dealing with businesses that had or wanted boards, um, you know, I didn't see the, the space where shareholders sat. And, and 
often and especially in smaller businesses, people who are shareholders but not necessarily operational in the business uh, don't really understand the roles. And I, I, in talking to colleagues in the U.S., especially some family businesses, some people who are shareholders think that they could do everything in the business and you know just come in and, and make decisions. So it's important to clarify the role and responsibility of a shareholder. Then there's the governance board or the board. And a lot of companies would say, and I've, I've tested this in, in some courses I give and uh, uh, to entrepreneurs, I ask them, who has a board and who doesn't have a board? And then half the room raises their hand. But the reality is everybody has a board. Everybody has a director or an administrator. You need to have at least one uh, to be, you know, to, to have a company. Somebody needs to be morally responsible for paying taxes, paying employees and everything. So everybody has some form of a governance board. And we'll talk about the different variations of governance boards that exist. Uh, and and the, the governance board uh, is, that's the person who's responsible, liable for everything the company does. So there's responsibility around that, and that's really important. And then advisory boards, which are becoming, we talked about that earlier, Mark, advisory boards are becoming a lot more popular where, you know, it, it's lonely, uh, it's lonely up there uh, being, you know, an owner. Uh, right. and, and, and there's a lot of things, you, you know, the world is changing fast and it's impossible for someone to know everything in, in all spheres of the world. And there's a lot of people who also have gotten amazing experience that could really help you and pull you, pull you up quite rapidly. Um, I'll give an example of my dad. My dad was a, a CFO of a large organization and he retired at a, a late age, but he was really a really good CFO. Uh, he wasn't as good a, of a networker as you are, Mark, or I, as I am. And when he retired, he would have liked to continue helping businesses, but he didn't know where to go. He didn't know how to p p position himself, but he would have been an amazing advisor to help some of these businesses grow and benefit from his expertise at a relatively low cost. Uh, so there's a lot of you know talent out there that small businesses could leverage really to break that ceiling and take them to the next level. So so that's how I I work with the owner's box. Those are the three ingredients or three um, stakeholders in the owner's box that I, I help structure and, and, and define and build the roles and responsibilities around those and how they interact with uh, the accountability chart. And so if you're a plumbing company, we talk about the plumber next door because really when – a lot of businesses, certainly in our target market, are, again, 10 to 250 employees. This might feel a little bit overwhelming or daunting or like, oh, I'm, I, you know, I have enough trouble just running my accountability chart. I have enough trouble getting customers and serving them well and collecting the cash. How do we think about simplifying that concept? So, I agree with you that we do have a board, whether you're the only one on it or not. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to have some help uh, to really challenge that that thinking? So what are your thoughts about how do we make that feel not – that you're really getting support and help and it's not this complex, hard, difficult thing that I need to do or have to do or – yeah, I, I think it's, there's a gradation, like there's an evolution as far as how do you build yourself uh, an advisory board or a governance board uh, where, you know, it could be starting with one person where you, you don't have a certain competency and that person helps you uh, think it through and improve your company, your your management style to better manage that company. And as, as you start getting used to it, then that could evolve to a larger board and a, a, a more structured uh, approach that evolves. And, you know, as we get to the advisory board uh, um, evolution, I'll show some of the, the steps that people could take to start with uh, the, the baby steps, actually. So the first steps and, you know, getting external help, getting comfortable with it, seeing the benefits. And then when you start seeing the benefits, then, you know what, you, you want more. I, I, I've seen some businesses um, really get excited about their advisory board because they have serious impact. So 
let me talk about one like i've there's one business and this is probably on the larger side but they had spent uh you know several millions of dollars in uh in e-commerce over the span of a few years and they were hiring talent but junior talent to run uh and launch a new project mm -hmm. and and they were a b2b trying to get into the b2c market and he he got tired and we got a very senior uh e-commerce guy come in as an advisor within a year the advisor challenged the owner on his strategy gave him some of his ideas and then at the end of the year uh the business owner decided you know what you're right uh, i'm getting out of the e-commerce space i'm only keeping a small portion that's relevant to the b2b space and basically for a few thousand dollars in the year he saw he he, he helped save this business owner millions of dollars Mm -hmm. So, so really, getting external help uh, could really accelerate and avoid making business uh, big, biz big business uh, mistakes, and also probably accelerate making biz big biz business successes as well. Yeah, totally, totally agree with that. So, if you kind of think about the definition of the owner's box, and what you're saying there is that this is a proper structure and it should be thought of as any other business process. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think it's, I believe, you know, and I, I'd have to ask you, like, what was the thought of, because in some of the books uh, EOS has, yeah. we talk about the owner's box, but it's never been defined. So, so I think EOS, or some of the people writing books had a reflection that there should be something there, but it never, we, we never got to it or it, it never was developed. Right. And so when you think about EOS and I say this often is that it is based in first principles, which means that it's like gravity or physics, <laughs> which, you know, so it's, it's true. It's been true for a thousand years. It's going to be true for a thousand more. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that when you break things down to that sort of elemental level and you come to things like an owner's box is that there's so much variability in the way that looks, the way that gets presented out in the world, that for us to be so bold as to write about, hey, this is how it is done, that we couldn't really do it in a first principles way. Mm -hmm. So that's been generally the the way that we've thought about it. And, and also, when we think about the visionary and the integrator, and we have a concept that's really baked into what it is that we do at EOS, and it comes from Strategic Coach and Dan Sullivan with the concept of unique ability, God-given talent, genetic encoding, and that we want to delegate and elevate to get you in that sweet spot. And so what happens when we're working with these companies and we're trying to get every single person inside that business to be living in that sweet spot, inevitably there's instances where that visionary, often the founder, CEO, whatever you want to call them, we call it visionary because that's what they're accountable for in the accountability chart, is they no longer want the business they've really are delegating and elevating out of the business so the concept of the owner's box came well they still own the company now what where do they go because they're not the right visionary or integrator for this business anymore where do they go and so we just started calling it the owner's box we would draw it on the whiteboard as a cloud like a cloud seat mm -hmm. <laughs> a fluffy seat um, so that's really the way it evolved over time was really just a place for that entrepreneur, that founder to go that wasn't in working in the business on a regular basis with any level of accountability for running the business. And so that's really how it evolved to become the owner's box. And, you know, this, this podcast part of it is to say, well, in the beginning, not very many, if any, of our clients 
had boards of any type. We kind of said, no, no, we're privately held. We don't work with companies with boards. And, and some implementers still take that position today. Uh, but the reality is, again, go, you know, reflecting back on the wealth transfer that will be occurring, we're going to have a lot more ownership structures where people are going to sell the company. They might be involved somewhat, but they're not going to be sitting in on the accountability chart. And so that's really how we got to where we are, is that there's so much variability. It's outside of our target market, or at least it was. Uh, and now that's evolving in, in what we see today. And so uh, what I do is, uh, and I didn't mention this uh, earlier, I'm also uh, a private equity. I'm 30% uh, of my time, I'm a partner in Keras Capital, which is a private equity. So uh, I do the the owner's box and EOS in all the companies. And, and I've moved from uh, working in companies to working on companies. And and I'm seeing that as a trend as well, where a lot of business owners uh, don't want to be operational anymore, but they still like their company. They see a bigger vision and a bigger opportunity, and be, we're starting to work on their company or their companies is becoming you know uh, really important and uh, and an important role, and especially lar larger structures and all structures. And EOS is amazing. Uh, in helping companies really get clarity, alignment, and and traction, and once those companies start getting traction, um, they're generating money. They, you know, acquisitions come around, and and now there, there's a role that for some entrepreneurs, not all, but some entrepreneurs, to level themselves up and really start working higher up on the the organization and within the owners box, the the board, the advisory board on. You know, how do I manage this this company or this portfolio of companies to get it to the next level? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so the way I see the owners box is, uh, it, it's really the company's corporate governance, and and as you get more shareholders, that's the other thing that could happen as a company grows. Um, it's the governance structures. It's the set of rules that protect uh, the shareholder rights and and responsibilities. Uh, and making sure that you know everybody, the shareholders, the stakeholders are 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 prop properly being considered. Mm -hmm. Now, from country to country, from different sets of rules and laws, what are the, some of the commonalities in the role of shareholders and the board and advisory board? And I think you put together a little bit of a list of what that might look like. What kind of variability does that take on from location to location, or is it generally the same in your mind? Yeah, there are differences, legal differences, and there's actually a book, I can't remember the title of the book, that, that really deep dives into the legal variances from one country to another, and the, uh, the fiscal, or the financial variances from one company to the other. So, uh, you know, that could be a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially the ones that, you know, are pretty much the same is, you know, the ones that I have here where, um, you know, what is, this, what is the shareholder and definition of the shareholder? And, you know, this is kind of the role and the responsibilities of a shareholder. And that's pretty common from one country to another. Um, I'd say that's also important for... Um, and I mentioned this a little earlier, a lot of companies have problems where, uh, you know, especially smaller family businesses, where people who, who are shareholder feel they're entitled to everything, and, and, and that really disrupts a lot of companies. So I find on the personal side that clarifying the role and clarifying uh, the responsibilities of that role is really important. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is, there's a lot of points here, but you know I, I put them all uh, so that you know people could understand. But you know, a, a shareholder has the right to vote who the administrators, and this not, might not be applicable for smaller businesses because people are wearing multiple hats. Right. But but as the company grows, their responsibility is to help vote who's going to represent them on the governance board. And again, the governance board 
is is going to be the people who are making the decisions, making sure that the shareholders are pr protected, um, and and making sure that you know their their voice is heard. But they don't necessarily have to be in the business, and they shouldn't be in the business to make uh, all those decisions. But you know, other decisions that you know, and depending on the bylaws that are set within the company, uh, you know, decisions on big capital structure changes. Uh, safety issues that the company might might have, financial imp uh, impacts uh, on on the business. Those could be uh, uh, special meetings that are called to implicate the, the shareholders. But if all goes well, the shareholders should be only there at the annual meeting and and not have to vote on every matter that comes to the board. So that the people that are voted to be responsible are taking on those responsibilities and making sure that the, the, the company is managed in the proper way. Mm -hmm. So e EOS now has multiple shareholders. Uh, how, right. how, do you, how does this resonate with you? So our private equity firm, uh, Firefly Group out of Indianapolis, you know, I do uh, assist with the shareholder updates and we do annual shareholder meetings and they are really, um, for the most part, a fence, if you will, for a lot of the shareholder relationships and questions and things like that. Really, people are going to them. Rarely, although they do, uh, come to me and, and ask questions about how the business is operating and, and going forward. So I don't really have to do too, too much shareholder management from my perspective, uh, but the board definitely does, right? I mean, the board is, is really taking on that uh, responsibility. Good. And again, like, depending on the personalities, the, the size, some of these are more important and less important than others. Right. But, but clarifying the role becomes extremely important so that, uh, like we do in the accountability chart, you know, mm -hmm. that level of ownership is also as important, especially especially now uh, where, you know, companies are becoming more complex and evolving fast. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So you're, you're mentioning family business because that uh, is very much something that we come into quite often. And when you think about the complexity that comes out of that and you've got ownership structures, family structures, board structures, how do you think about how that works? Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's a, something that was developed by the Harvard Business School and, and two, uh, two professors there. And basically, a little like I said earlier, they realized that, you know what, there's some challenges as far as families understanding the role in the company and really not um, not interfering with uh, the operations of the company. So they developed uh, the three circle model, which is the following one you see there, where it talks about ownership, family, and business, and kind of separates you know the the, the roles of the individuals within those three circles. And the ones that are at the center are really, the family owners that are working and operating the business, and they have a certain responsibility and ownership that that you know that you know should, should you know be respected by the other family members that might not be in the operations. I find this when I, I work with some some families to to this helps them understand the different levels of responsibility. And this I use this exercise to uh, kind of help define the role of the shareholders and the family members that are owners but need to respect that they, they won't be involved in all decisions. And that's where we, we kind of start uh, uh, defining where they will be involved. So often there will be the annual meeting or special meetings that could be called based on certain conditions that will happen. So, so this framework really helps me uh, better manage conflicts mm -hmm. and improve communications. And, and how often do you find where these family businesses have 
all of these different groups? Because for me, this would seem a little bit like something that has to be addressed. It does exist. Is it 20% of the time that you see this? Is it 80% of the time? What percentage of the time when you're working with clients do you see this type of um, family plus other shareholder type structures? I'd say 20 to 30% would be the right, you know, the right range. And, yeah. and you know, it, some families are really good. Like, you know, so like all families, some families get along and, yeah, sure. and you know, they, they, they could naturally fall into uh, their space and respect uh, the, 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 other, uh, the other roles. Some families uh, need help uh, in, in bringing clarity and they need external expertise that have seen other models before to help them understand what their role is and respect um, the, other, the, the, the other roles that you know, need to be more involved on the business. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, 20, 30% would be the right, the right uh, amount on family businesses, yeah. Yeah, good. All right, so then you, know, you have the shareholders and then if we dig down into some owner's boxes, we have a governance board which might be a foreign, scary concept to, yeah. to folks. Uh, well, what does that be? What does that look like? Do I have one and not know it? Uh, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what a governance board is uh, in contrast maybe to shareholders or advisory. Yeah, so the governance board, like a, 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 govern, a board, like we could see, put it as a simple matter, it's a, it's a board, but governance is basically the system of rules and practices and processes that will help uh, govern, uh, govern or manage the business. And, and what, what a board does is they're taking on the decisions on, especially the financial decisions, the legal decisions, making sure that, um, like, I, I, when I go into a, a company, I, I, I position the company, especially when I do the accountability chart, the company's a person, it's a legal person that we're creating, and, and everybody's contributing to build the character uh, of that person. Uh, and, and basically, that person is not a moral person because it's a company, it, it doesn't act, but it acts through others. So the moral, the, the, the governance board is the moral people that represent that company. So it's kind of the godfathers of that company and, and they're morally responsible for the actions that that company does because they're taking the decisions. And, and if there's a lack of decisions on, and that's where the accountability falls, is mm -hmm. that that company is not respecting the laws, that company is not paying its taxes, um, the, the people that are bored are liable and personally responsible for the actions the company takes. So, so uh, being a director is a really important, uh, a, a really important role. You ask like how many people have boards? Well, everybody has a board. Yeah. Uh, if you're creating a company, you have to have a minimum of one director who owns those responsibilities. Now, and, and that would be a compliance board. So it's like you have one person, you need to do it, and you're doing you know, the minimum, and that's often what happens in a smaller organization. Um, and that would be a compliance board. So that the compliance board would be the minimum level of a board that an organization has, and everybody at the minimum would have a compliance board. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. it grows in complexity as more shareholders get added on and, and, and the, you know, the size of the company grows. Right. Right. Okay. So then how does that contrast with, well, <laughs> let, let, let's go into, okay, now you've got the governance board. There's obviously many types of governance boards and uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and I, I don't want it to be a little bit overwhelming for for folks to get a you know start to you you grow into these things is what I'm saying <laughs> you know as you said there's sort of a a continuum and it gets more complex as you grow so if you want to go in a little bit of detail into these types of of different governance boards. Yeah, and, and and you're you're right. Like this could be daunting for somebody that says, "Oh my God, I'm I'm starting." It. But like I said, everybody has at least a compliance board, uh, and the compliance board is to make sure that 
you know, it, somebody's responsible for the actions of the company mm -hmm. and making sure that uh, taxes are paid, uh, uh, the, 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 the company is a good citizen and all of that. Then if there's a family business, some, 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 some family members might want to be on the board and start, you know, better understanding how we structure ourselves and, and we're doing the right things, helping on the strategic planning uh, and, you know, con uh, and, and putting some structure. So it's a good way to introduce, and I've seen families bring in their kids in a board structure so that they're involved and they're, they, 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 they get to see the, um, the financials of the company, the decisions, the responsibilities that, that, that you know, get taken on. On uh, then an inner circle board, and I, I talked about the, the uh, uh, competency gaps earlier. Well, you know what? If if you're not really strong on legal, and often companies mm -hmm. aren't, like right. uh, either legal or financial, you might say, you know what? It's time to probably start professionalizing our board, and and let's bring in our accountant or our lawyer on board so that they help us think differently and bring in some more professionalism to our board. And, well, on and, that and, on that note, Patrick, yeah. at what point of revenue, profit, growth prospects, at what point would you start to say, "Hey, we should begin thinking this way?" Because, you know, if I'm from a entrepreneur's perspective, you're like, "Well, this is going to cost me a lot of money, and I'm not sure that the payoff's going to be there." Um, how, how do, how do, does a company start thinking? When should they start thinking like that? I, I think to your earlier point, you grow into it. So I think you, you should start thinking about how do I build out my governance and my, my, my board structure to help me get the, the, uh, the, the capabilities that I don't have. And we'll talk about that earlier. And, and there's different forms, like to your point, it, it's, it's not standard at, at $10 million, this is the board you should have. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really depends on the industry, the maturity of your, your, your leadership team, what you want to do and everything. So there's, there's different permutations that could come out of it. But I, I'd say companies that, uh, it depends on if they're growing fast or not. If you're growing, if you're a $3 million company, but you're doubling every second year, um, you probably need help to really structure yourself and, and you know, put in proper governance so that you're not making mistakes, but also getting proper expertise to grow in the right way and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and make sure that you're, you're covering your bases on the legal side, on the fiscal side, uh, to, to not make, put the, the, the company in a bad position. But I've seen companies, uh, I work with companies around $5 million dollars. Uh, in revenue where we're starting to put advisory boards and uh, a smaller group of advisors to really help the company uh, evolve. And, and, and then it becomes a mix of, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the next few slides, but a mix of uh, an advisory board that reports into the governance board. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is that uh, if you have a compliance board and insider board, uh, they'll say, you know what, because a, a board will decide on the CEO salary, a board will decide on, um, on the dividends you'll pay, a board will decide if you're buying a private jet or not. And at times an owner, an owner will say, you know what, I don't want anybody to start deciding that for me. So I, I want to keep a smaller board so that I, I'll keep the responsibility of the company, the liabilities of the company, but I, I need the feedback. So they'll they'll have a certain board structure to keep that level of uh, of autonomy, but they'll put an advisory board to help them solve problems, and and then it becomes a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when when we kind of then go down to advisory boards, as you're mentioning, we're going to take a deep dive into that. Before we move on, though, do you want to say anything about the inner circle, the quasi-independent? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. So inner circle, like I said, is bringing in one or two professionals. So often there'll be a lawyer or an accountant that, you know, they're outside the family, and now we're starting to you know, want to build it to a, a more professional structure and, and we feel that our company is at that level. And then 
quasi-independent, and the one after would be an independent board, which would be public company. But quasi-independent would be, you know what, you're getting external people that have different types of expertise um, that, um, th that could help the company evolve and think differently. And I'd assume that EOS is at that level now, where uh, it's not only people that work in the business, uh, obviously it's not family members, uh, because now you know, yeah. the ownership structure is, is... So I think that EOS is probably at the quasi-independent board level, where you have different expertise coming from external, really helping reflect on the direction that the company should be taking. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Absolutely. Good. Um, so if you want, and we talk, you asked those questions earlier. So yeah. basically advisory boards are there to close the gaps on competencies and help a business um, solve problems. So an advisory board is really getting expertise and I'll talk how I, I build my advisory boards uh, afterwards. I use a lot of the EOS tools to do that. Mm -hmm. But there's a BBC, so the Bank of Development of Canada that, that was done a few years ago. And, and they did a survey and realized that um, companies who had advisory boards were doing a lot better. And they, they were, their sales and productivity were a lot higher than the ones that didn't. Uh, sales were 25, 24, 25% higher than a company that did not have uh, an advisory board and, and people that came in and, and helped them. And there's different types of advisory board. There's um, uh, a corporatized advisory board and a corporatized advisory board. So the, the, the company I talked to you earlier on, yeah. uh, they, their structure is basically, uh, they have um, um, uh, uh, a, a compliance board and 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 they're a two billion dollar business. They have a compliance board, uh, and and then they put in an advisory board that could run like a um, a tomorrow that board could become uh, a, a public company board. So it's really run like a, 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 a governance board, with the exception that we're not taking the decision on the CEO salary. We're not taking decisions on on um, dividends. We're not taking decisions on types, things they, they, they would buy, um, but we're giving them a lot of expertise, a lot of reflections so that they could, you know, better make decisions. And, right. and also the, the advantage for advisors is that you're not personally liable for the company's action. Uh, and in being an advisor, you're there to share and help solve problems but the decision goes to the board level. But the people on the board level are personally liable. If the company does wrong, they will be sued. And, and when you get to, and this, I don't know if you would know, but uh, the fact that EOS is a quasi-independent board, uh, you, you probably have directors and officers insurance uh, because the people taking on a board seat on, on, on EOS are personally liable for all the actions that you know, the company does. So they want to make sure that, you know, what if there's something that happens, they're covered and they're insured. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, when you think about, so the company you're talking about, you said is like 2 billion in, in revenue and they have these sort of two separate board structures. Are, is there any overlap between the two different types of boards that are occurring at the same time? Or are they just um, interacting independently of one another? So one feeds into the other. So there's, yeah. there's, there's maybe some overlap, but mm -hmm. the primary board for them is the advisory board. The, yeah. the, the, and then the two guys just meet and say, okay, what do we do? Like how much you, how much you going to get paid and how much am I going to get paid next year? And they make those decisions and you know, th that's their board structure. And, and, but, but as far as, you know, getting the strategy, getting the view on where they're going in the future, uh, getting feedback, um, hiring, uh, hiring new executives, they'll definitely have those conversations with the advisory board. The advisory board will give them a lot of ideas, a lot of reflections, a lot of feedback, and then they'll make their decisions on their own. 
The advisory mm-hmm. board will not make the decision. The advisory right. board will share a lot of experience, give them feedback, put them in contact with people that could help them if they they you know they can't personally help them, uh, and that just helps uh, the two owners make better decisions and and make better decisions faster. Got it. Got it. And so they're not voting on, you know, hey, we're going to go do this now. They're not uh, keeping a a record or anything like that. Um, Well, they take, so there are minutes that are taken at the advisory board level. Like I said, mm -hmm. it's a a government, it's a corporatized uh, advisory board. So they take minutes and, 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 you know, it's very professional, but uh, it's not, uh, there's no, legal liability with right. the advisors the the minutes are taken to better feed decisions at the corporate uh, at the uh, at the governance board right right okay so you've got the governance board you've got advisory board um and as you kind of uh, already have alluded to you've got the decision making you've got problem solving advice and it's, I think it is important to think about these are multiple options for you. There can be overlap. There doesn't have to be overlap. Um, so I think that's super useful for for folks to kind of think about. You've got options. <laughs> you, you, do have, you, you do have options. And, and, and you know, there, there's a process to being able to get there to make the right decisions. And to your point, it also evolves afterwards, right? As yeah. your company grows, as your needs evolve, uh, especially on the advisory board uh, side, I'll, I'll talk about that. But you know, an advisory board, you could have uh, advisors that change every two years based on the challenge that you're trying to address and the elevation to your ten-year goal. So I use I use the U.S. ten-year goal as the, the milestone we're trying to achieve, as we're, mm-hmm. we're doing within the company. And then I, I develop a, a competency gap, we'll talk about that afterwards. And then based on the competency gap, we prioritize it with uh, getting what you want. And basically now we, we get the right advisors to come in and help uh, us elevate ourselves on those gaps, the competency gaps that we've identified. And as we fulfill those, we move on to the next one to help the company evolved to the ultimate goal. Yeah. So I think it's important to acknowledge as we're going through this is that not every founder, not every entrepreneur will want to participate (laughs) in this type of structure. And I can see in a lot of entrepreneurs that, that I interact with and they might get to the advisory board level and then after that it starts to get a little too complex they stop having fun i think it's really important to as uh, you know know thyself yep. where if you're if you want your company to continue to grow beyond what your capabilities are and that you're willing to participate in that it will require a higher level of scrutiny of challenge of growth for you as a as a person to participate in these types of boards and that might be a good time to think about like hey i've given everything i've got i'm at the end of what my capabilities or desires are and now it's time to maybe even sell the company and then a different uh, leader takes over who's going to push the the business beyond where you've taken it. What percentage would you say of founders who recognize that it's time to go themselves? And how many are willing to participate in advisory, then go to the next stage, to the next stage, and be the leader the entire time? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, we, we, you started off with this podcast uh, in saying that there's 12 million businesses that are going to change hands. So, yeah. so, 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 so there's a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and you know what? An advisory board could help people in, 
different forms. It could help people who want to sell prepare themselves better. Like you're yeah. going to sell a company probably once in your life. And, and it's something you've never done before. Uh, so you can't be an expert in doing it. And, <laughs> no, and, 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 usually not. And getting people who have done it and have experience, let's say, on, on the financial side, on the industry side, on the, you know, probably the network, could help you do a, a much better sell and prepare yourself and structure yourself so that you're selling it better. On the flip side, if you're a buyer, you're probably buying your first business or and and this is probably a new sphere at times it could be a strategic buy so it, it, it will easily fit but again getting that experience on board to really absorb a business and then help build a strategic plan is getting the right people will help you probably uh kick off the business a, a lot more smoothly and help uh, generate better performance mm-hmm. uh so to, to your question like how many people? Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be saying, I'm getting out of this. Uh, sometimes they do it too late, unfortunately. Uh, like they, they keep on working and, and they probably lose value uh, because they're, they're stretching themselves and, 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 and technology moves fast and they haven't changed the technology platforms internally. So, so there's a, a loss of value and, and maybe a loss of expertise employees that get discouraged. So, 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 you know, a lot of people in the next few years will be uh, putting up their, their their businesses up for sale and will need help to be able to do that more successfully. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And to, to your point, I mean, some of the most successful entrepreneurs on the planet, some of them still haven't sold a business, <laughs> right? They don't, haven't, haven't experienced that yet. Maybe they're public and, and maybe they're they're growing. Um, but if you, if you go and find, you know, multi exited entrepreneurs, they in their entire lifetime will have sold a handful of businesses at most as to your point as well is that most will sell one, they build companies, but private equity and other types of structures buy and sell businesses regularly. They don't run companies and they don't build companies necessarily. Um, but they have a lot of experience in what it looks like to transfer a company from one set of ownership to another and do that to maximize the value. So I think it's just really important to take advantage of that because you can build to that, right? I mean, you can build to something that has maximum value and getting the advisory folks who've done that multiple times, you know, if you got a, a board of four people and they've each sold two companies, you know, that's more than most people will ever experience in their whole life. <laughs> yeah, totally. And, and you said it earlier on, like, uh, there's a lot, there's a surge, there's a growth in private equity, uh, mm-hmm. uh, businesses that are buying companies. Uh, Firefly is a good example with the US. But I'm also seeing a growth in family offices, like uh, uh, yeah. businesses that say, hey, you know what, I, I've structured my company. I've done an amazing job with EOS in, you know, making it work without me being engaged in it. And you know what? I see the opportunity to buy other companies that will be connected or or in different fields. And I want to start building a portfolio company, uh, a portfolio of companies uh, under my family office. And I, I'm seeing lots of that happening. And uh, and that's also a growing space. Yeah, and for they, sure. And they're a key on advisors because they know they don't know a whole bunch of things and getting the right people, the right advisors, the right board members uh, to help them think through and, and think through a growth strategy for those businesses becomes critical for them. So when you think about so your, your seven advantages of an advisory board, if you can take us through that. And also, I'd like you to comment on you can have an advisory board, but couldn't you get something similar to this from a peer group as an example? So we've got yeah, yeah. YPO, we've got yeah. EO, we've got all sorts of different um, forum groups and things like that. Could they, those groups fulfill something similar to an advisory board? And, and with these seven advantages, are there any differences there? 
Yeah, so let's talk about that. And that's kind of the gradation and the evolution towards more structured and professional uh, advisory boards. So we kind of walk through with the compliance board uh, on the governance side, but advisory boards, somewhat the same thing. Like, you know, at, at the very lower level, like family and friends could be advisors and give you ideas. The challenge there is that, you know, they're giving you opinions, but at times it, it's just, it's very high level. It's like they haven't worked in those businesses. They probably, you, you probably have an accountant that works in another industry that will give you good advice, but it won't be as precise as, uh, as you know, re and as relevant as to your industry. Then YPO, EO, uh, uh, peer groups, uh, Vist uh, Vistage, uh, are, are great groups. You'll, you'll be working with peers who have businesses in other industries and challenges and successes, and they could share them, but they won't be able to get as involved uh, at a deeper level because they have a business to run and they probably don't necessarily understand your industry and their expertise might not be the competency gap that's important for you to address, but it's still very valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a good way to start interacting and exchanging with other people. And then as you, as you evolve, then you get into single advisors. So um, you're getting one advisor, often it will be for accounting or finance, uh, those are, are, are big, uh, or HR. Uh, you know, getting an, one advisor to really help you work through uh, certain of those problems and, and tackle them. But they're, they're very laser focused, tactical on one problem and they're not overseeing the overall, uh, uh, the overall issues of the business. And then the next level is really getting uh, an advisory board where you're getting two, three members and now you're meeting them so, and, and they're there specifically for uh, certain roles, certain competency gaps that you want to fill. And, and they're there to really understand the business because every quarter they'll be receiving some information on the business. So the package, which you guys send to your board members on explaining where you're at, where you were, where you're at and where you're going. And basically they'll review it and then come into an advisory board discussion, a three hour board discussion where you'll be focused on discussing the business and leveraging their expertise, their contacts to help accelerate the business and achieve their, the, the, the quarterly rocks that you, you, you're, you're probably trying to tackle in the next quarter. Like I use, I use, um, I take the two biggest quarterly rocks in the, uh, in my advisory boards and I get the owners of those rocks to come and present and participate in the discussion. And that's also en enriching for um, the, 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 the accountability chart or the people within the accountability chart, because now they're being exposed to professionals, people who have done certain things at bigger levels often than the company you're in. And, and that's highly beneficial for the people presenting because they're getting exposure and also benefiting from that expertise to help tackle those those issues and rocks and also grow themselves as a professional. For sure. And when we think about, I think number four on the seven advantages of an advisory board with accountability, you kind of start off with the uh, friends and family, maybe the single advisors and things like that. There's really no accountability associated with that. And I think you do get some of that with peer accountability if you're in the right group for you with YPO and EO and Vistage and other places. Uh, and that is so valuable. And the, the other thing that you said with having rock owners on the leadership team come and present to an advisory board or the board, however you define it, is enriching to them. And I, I think about the quote from Einstein. Now, whether he said it or not, it's attributed to him, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is if he had an hour to, to solve a problem, he'd spend 55 minutes on determining the right question. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you think about that, you're coming and you're presenting to people who have experience that you don't have. They're taking different perspectives that that you don't have what you're really getting is the right questions yep. 
to solve the you problem know. that you never even thought of because it's outside of the realm of your um, experience. So and, and, I can't and, emphasize enough how valuable of an education that is. I mean, it's professional development times 10. Yeah, you said it in, uh, in other words at times, they're too much in the forest. Like they're, they're, their face is right in front of the tree. We help them pull, yeah. pull, pull out of the forest and see the bigger picture. Uh, I, I'm a YPO member and mm -hmm. uh, one of my YPO colleagues in Montreal said, Pat, I want an advisory board. I've been running my business for 30 years and I haven't been accountable to anyone. I want mm -hmm. to be accountable to a group of people that are going to put pressure on me to become better. And I, I yeah. thought that was amazing. Like, you know what? So you, you need to want to be challenged and, and, and feel that, you know, it's going to help, it's going to help you personally, but it's going to help you also grow the company to another level and make a better company out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh I mean, accountability is something that people avoid because it's hard. It causes growth. It's like, you know, it's like going to the gym. You know, you got to put things under pressure in order to grow, right? In order to get faster and smarter and better. Um, it's, it's easy to push it off otherwise. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, okay. So how does one go about creating a board for their, their business. They've reached the point where they want to be accountable. They see the value in it of growing it and growing themselves and growing the company. And they're going to, they're not going to go and sell. They were like, I'm in this, we're going, uh, how do they go about, what are the steps to take them through to do that? Yeah. So we're throwing a lot of information. Tons. All at once. <laughs> so, so, you know, there, there's a process that takes longer than this podcast to be able to get to where we right. want to get to. Uh, but the first step is really, you know, doing a discovery with the company and, and helping them understand all the components. Uh, and, 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 you know, the first element is really what type of governance board structure do you have or do you want to keep and, and understanding the pros and cons of each level and, and the timing of each level. You brought that up earlier. Mm -hmm. Like uh, not everybody should be going into a quasi independent board uh, because, you know, it, it looks good. There's, there are implications financially, but also um, uh, th that will put pressure on the organization and that might not be the right step to take. It was the right one for EOS, but no, it might not be the right one for everyone. Most mm -hmm. of them I'd say uh, uh, are either compliance or insider boards the, with the companies that I work with, uh, you know, with a few exceptions, uh, because they want to keep control, single family, they don't need anybody external, they don't want to share uh, some of the key financials, and they'll say, you know what, we want to keep the decisions, we want to keep the, the, the responsibility and liability. And, you know, so it's really establishing what type of board uh, we putting because you have a board <laughs> and, yeah. and the minimum will be a compliance board. Right. And it might be just then, you. <laughs> it might be just you. That's right. But, right. you know, you, you, you need to have a moral person responsible for the company. Yeah. The second step, this, and I'm a fellow of the Advisory Board Center, which is an organization that helps train uh, and put structure around uh, advisory boards. And this comes from them. Uh, and it's establishing what is your growth cycle? What stage uh, are you in your company? Are you an emerging company? You're starting a company? And, and that will require different types of advisors. Are you a growing company? Are you an ex exiting company? Are you doing a change where you know what you've hit the ceiling and you need to change things because things are not going going well those will take different types of advisors or different different types of people to help you uh realign and and position it like let, let me get into this like uh, uh in the old times but <laughs> it, it still happens now but you know a lot of boards were bo boys clubs it's like oh it's like yeah i'll, I'll develop a board like a I, I, I like this guy or this guy was CEO of a company and you know what, he's got a good name and let me put trophies and, and build a board with, uh, with good names or with some of my friends. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't resolve and that doesn't help the company. Like, you know what, you need to really have the right people, 
the right tools to really fix the problems that you have and and then for the right amount of time because it, it doesn't mean that you know if that was the right person to 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 address a certain problem once that problem is resolved you know that person now might not be the right person for the future so there's also a process to to change people on the board like often I, i've been on 30 over 30 boards and often yeah, you know, once you got on the board, you were there for life. It was kind of royalty, uh, mm-hmm. where it's like you're on the board, and it's like there, there wasn't a process to evaluate you. There wasn't a process to say, well, you know what? Thank you for what you you did because that's what we needed to do. But you know, we need other people to address other problems in the future. So, so what stage of growth are you in is really important. Yeah, it um... then. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, uh, uh, I don't know if you have a question or a comment on step two. I'm, uh, I was going to get to step three now. Yeah, so m- my only thought was when you said the old boys club, and I kind of started to think about, well, it makes sense that universities and alumni associations and things like that probably would have had a pretty uh, outsized influence on who's on a board because, you know, you went to school with them, you know them, and, okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> this is my board now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Step three. Step three. So how do you select the, the, the right people and understand the right people? So like I said, like, you know, getting trophy titles and people, that's great, but they might not be, often I tell people like, that person probably didn't do the, the, the competency gap you want to fill. It might be the person under him that did it, and he would be a better contributor to your company. So what I do is I, I work with companies in taking their 10-year target. So go into uh, the VTO. What is your 10-year target? What, what are we striving to get to? And, and how do we get the right people to help us get there? So, and I, I, I asked them, how are you going to operate in 10 years? Like, like, if we project ourselves in 10 years, wh- how is that business going to run? And what are the new competencies that we're going to need? And what are the competencies that we're going to elevate? So financially, uh, you know, how is that, is that going to change? If so, what are, how is that going to operate? And does your current CFO or person in charge of finance going to be able to get there? We might have to coach them or we might have to start thinking of, you know, potentially eventually um, replacing them or, or putting somebody above them to be able to help them uh, get to uh, where we want to be. Are, are you going to go international? So if so, we need somebody who has international experience mm-hmm. to come in and, and, and feed the organization with how to get there, what doors to knock on to be able to uh, uh, be able to you know, pierce through that. Is uh, technology going to have influence on the business? If so, what do we think it's going to have as an impact on the business in 10 years from now? How do we get that expertise to help us walk us through uh, that and I, I think you had that experience with EOS uh, yeah. with the shifts that we're doing. For uh, sure. And then, uh, then I use um, uh, you know the, the, uh, another EOS tool called Getting What You Want to really prioritize how we're gonna you know get those advisors in at the right time to be able to help us get to our ten year target. Yeah, we definitely experienced that at. EOS with going through a digital transformation. We started building software. And so a, a part of our company became a SaaS business. And so we had to go out and find board members that have that experience that can help guide us. And then not only that, but retain the unique nature of what it is that we do at EOS. And so having the right people around the table was really important for us and um, we we're fortunate that we had plenty of people who are interested in doing that <laughs> yeah so and so here are back the slides back so you know back to what I said earlier we use this slide to really help them decide what type of board do you have like mm-hmm. what is what are the implications I have more content there what is you know what is your strategy in aligned activity like are you an emerging, exiting, growing, or changing uh, business? So we, we talk about that and identify, you know, where they are, what does that mean, 
And then that leads to the type of help that they need and the type of structure we need to put in place. Uh, get, pay, go to the VTO, I take the 10 year target. Basically that becomes you know the destination and then we work back with getting what you want to identify the competency gaps that we need to be able to get ourselves to our 10 year target. And those become the roles and responsibilities of the advisor or board member profiles that we want to get on the advisory board. And then once we have that, then um, you mentioned EO. I, I use EO, uh, uh, EO YPO advisory board center, e even EOS, like EOS has an amazing network of mm -hmm. implementers that have relationships. So, so a lot of those implementers could have clients or, uh, or, or people that you know might be well suited to help another company uh, as a, uh, as an advisor. And, and I think that it's a really important distinction here with the ten year target and the getting what you want tool, because what happens is you wherever your company is today, wherever your structure is, whatever talent you have. And this applies not only to your advisory boards or the boards that you're using, it applies to your entire leadership team, your people inside your organization, that when you set that 10-year target, it creates this dynamic tension between where you are and where you want to go. And that getting what you want tool is just a great way to map out, well, what are all of the resources? What are What's all the talent? What's all the experience that I'm going to need in order to get to that 10 year target and working your way back from where you want to go to where you are today. And that just gives you just such a great roadmap of the who that you need to get to where you want to go. You know what you said it like, you know, I love this tool because it really helps build the discussion the reflection and, and getting to the key, elements, not the people, not the trophy uh, titles that you want to get on your board, but the key, um, the, the, the key needs that you need to elevate your company to the next level. And then once mm -hmm. we define them, then, you know, the next step is, you know, finding the right, the right people to fill those seats. So G, GWC. <laughs> All right, get it, want it, capacity to do it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> For sure. And, and actually, I used that, so I, I could have put that there, I should have put it there, but definitely, uh, and, and you'll see it on the next, next slide, we build a profile, a, 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 a role, a description, and basically approach people, and we GWC them for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, thinking about get it, want it, capacity, you do it in the role. What are your thoughts around core values? Do they need to share the core values uh, of the business? Totally, yeah, and that's it. Actually, that's an amazing point. I, I I do it, but you know, I, I didn't bring it up in this presentation. But definitely, I, actually, that's probably the first thing that needs to happen mm -hmm. is that people need to fit the core values and and the, the, the connection. So, you know, in the process, I I uh, the, the business owner might know people, so they'll talk to them, and then I'll talk to them if they they feel they they you know they get it, they want it, and they have the capacity to do it. And then I'll talk to them and, and I'll challenge them on, uh, on the values and making sure that there's a fit because that person gets really intimate with the business and, and you know, the, the key owners. So they need to have a cultural fit or else, uh, or else it won't work. Yeah. And like for myself and my experience with our board is that we've got a, we have a lot of fun together. Um, mm -hmm. it's kind of an interesting thing where people are like, oh, you're here on business and you're going to be do boring things and not have a good time. We have a heck of a lot of fun, uh, at our, at our board meetings, uh, which is just obviously a gift. And I think that does say that we do share core values and our culture is really around because that culture fit is there. It, mm -hmm. it, it makes the experience a good experience. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't have hard conversations and that we don't debate, discuss, and have friction, but uh, we definitely have a lot of fun. Well, you need to, it's five dysfunctions of a team need to also be addressed there. So That's right. So, you need to, so, so it's really similar to the accountability chart and, and what mm -hmm. we do in the U.S., but at, at a different level that, you know, addresses different needs of the organization. Yeah. 
Okay, so you've got the your. So then, then we work on establishing it. So, so basically, once we've clarified it and we've gone through the discovery, helping the business understand um, what are the different levers uh, uh, to to put the governance structure in place, then um, we put a a governance charter, an accountability chart for you know the governance charter. So basically, explaining what the board is, what the advisory board is, what the shareholders' responsibilities are, and how they interact with each other. And I kind of also do a diagram that we'll see in a few slides from now to also visualize that so that it's clear for people. It's like, okay, well, I understand what the board does. I understand what the advisory board does. And I understand the role of the um, of the shareholders. Mm -hmm. and, and that... That's kind of the accountability, accountability chart for governance, the, the, the governance uh, level. Then we go out and find and select uh, board directors or advisors. So basically, um, on the board director side, like like I said, that's probably not as important for smaller businesses because the owners are the board directors and they might be only one. So that would be the compliance board level. But on the advisory board, I definitely use, and we talked about it earlier, YPO, EO, different associations, advisory board center. And you could use headhunters as well. Like if you have a certain role that's really complicated and that might be exclusive, like uh, for example, you're opening up shop in Japan, uh, you might want to have somebody who's got an understanding of US businesses or, uh, uh, and, and you know the, the Japanese market, and that could help you really uh, open up that, that business successfully in that environment. So, mm -hmm. so the headhunters could be also um, a good way to, uh, you know, do uh, the recruiting. I talked about this earlier, so DNO insurance. So this is for governance boards. Uh, it's, this is not applicable for advisory boards, but this is uh, directors and, and officers insurance. Mm -hmm. So that's costly for a business. So that might actually be a reason why you don't want uh, a board because this will bring in extra costs on, on the business. Uh, and the advisory board uh, doesn't have that requirement of having uh, the insurance. But we draft up contracts and agreements. So it's kind of a roles and responsibilities but and the expectations. And there's also a process to evaluate the board members on an annual basis, mm -hmm. making sure that the owners are happy and that um, that the advisors are doing what they were expected to do. Uh, it's not just showing up, it's really showing up, participating, sharing, and helping the company get to its 10-year goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, just a question on the YPO, EO, and you know you're kind of doing this interview process. How would you think about that in terms of interviewing? What's the right peer group network for you? It, it, it depends on the, the the roles you're recruiting. Like sometimes yeah. that role will be in an association in a, in this in. In an industry association, because you're looking for something that's very niche, so it really ties back to the definition of the capacity gap you're trying to fill mm -hmm. and the role and responsibility of that capacity gap. And then, you know, what I do is I uh, I'll take that role, I'll talk to a few members, I'll do a lot of research on LinkedIn. I didn't mention LinkedIn there, there, but I'll I'll do uh, searches on LinkedIn or each of those. Um, uh, channels, uh, uh, directories for for each of those channels, and talk to people. I, I kind of act as a headhunter to really help the businesses find the the right profiles that they need. What I think that the important piece there is you're coming in with total clarity on what your tenure target is what those competency gaps are, the resources, the training, the knowledge, everything that you need in order to get there. And you're taking that really what the getting what you want tool has produced and you're taking that into your search. And I think if you're unclear 
on what those expectations are, you're going to flounder a little bit in who you're trying to select, what groups you may join, the structure of your board. I think you, if you're not totally crystal clear on that, I think the results are going to be not quite what you want because you don't know what you want. <laughs> uh, or you just didn't communicate it in a way that made sense to anyone. Uh, and so I, I think that's just an important step in making those selections. Uh, totally. Like, and that's why I love the tools. Like, the tools really bring up the discussion of, you know, what, what are we trying to get to? What do we need to get there? And let's define it and, and you know, bring it to clarity. And then once we have that, definitely it simplifies the process of getting the right people and not just looking at the trophy titles that you know, will come on the board. We're really laser focused on getting the people that will be able to do the job that we've defined. Yeah. Awesome. So you have a little bit of a, a graphic on what it looks like as it relates to the accountability yeah. chart. Yeah. So, so this is an example of what, and typically a lot of my businesses that a lot of the businesses I work with resemble this. So, so you have the shareholders. Uh, we'll define who the shareholders are. I'll have the names in there, uh, the the number of shares or the percentage of the business they own, and that will go into um, the document that I'll produce uh, for, uh, for to to be shared with the the board advisors that will be selected. Then we define uh, what is the board. So is it a compliance board? If so, who's the person that's the, the board member and the board chair because they're only one? If it's an insider board, so uh, family members included, we'll, we'll define them. And then we'll build an advisory board and there we'll put the advisors, list the advisors, and the advisors will often report into uh, the board uh, and will the board members will often be part of the advisory board as well and will interact with the uh, accountability chart often it will be uh, the and I'd like to hear you on that but often it will be the visionary and the um, the visionary and the integrator that will be part of the advisory board but some of the other members like I said earlier the rock the key rocks that we'll talk about will come in and present so there will be other members that will be not there on a regular basis but they'll be coming in on a an ad hoc basis based on the the key rocks that we want to discuss and address mm -hmm. so how, uh, what do you what do you ask like who, who's presenting at the board uh level from uh, the accountability chart of us so both Kelly Knight, my integrator, and I do attend every single board meeting. Kelly sort of does the integration of the board. Uh, and it, what I mean by that is all the coordination, all the scheduling, all the note taking and list keeping. I'm there. I'm presenting a visionary report, sort of what's on my mind, good and bad and, and everything in between. <laughs> and that we usually do that the night before then we go in to the board meetings usually about four hours or so and it's kelly and i and just as you said sometimes we bring in leadership team members to present on one particular topic or another to get input from the board on one topic or another and so that's exactly how we do it as, as you've laid it out here amazing Except that your structure is probably not an advisory board. You're, you'd be the quasi-independent board at the top, and that's you wouldn't have the advisory board at, uh, at the bottom. That's what I'm assuming. Right, and it, it sort of functions. So Kelly and I do not have a vote on the board as an official board member, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And then we have um, an observer. Uh, who's our largest equity shareholder, who's also really an advisor on that board. And then we've got uh, our ownership group, um, our PE owners. They are board members and have a vote. And then we have three additional board members that have a vote that come from various skill sets and industries and things that are applicable to us. And, and they have a vote. 
Okay, amazing. Yep, so that's how that works. So how do we execute? So you, you kind of got into that uh, w with the, the, the last comments, but um, basically once we've selected the members, um, I, I do a kind of a board introduction call. So this only happens, you know, to kick it off. Uh, so we, we introduce, well, we thank the advisors, the board members to, for joining. Uh, we give them access to uh, a data room where they'll have documents to better understand uh, what's happening with the company, uh, the history of the company, and so on. We kind of do a quick round table of people introducing themselves. I, I wrote 60 minutes, but that's the, the, the longest it would take. It would take about 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, we, we confirm that all contracts were received and signed, um, and, and then confirm the dates for the next four board meetings and then do a quick Q&A uh, with, with the members to make sure that you know, everything is clear and we're ready for, for, for the upcoming board. Usually we do that around six weeks before the first board. Um, the first board will often be downloading information. I, I don't know if you remember that from when you did it with US with, uh, with uh, Firefly and the board members that came in, but it's really giving and, and you know, kind of feeding um, the board members doing, in certain cases, it might not be, uh, uh, EOS is kind of virtual, but, uh, you know, especially with certain manufacturers, we visit the plant, we, we go through, uh, you know, walk through and get to know the business, understand uh, how the process gets the product done, and, um, and that we do that. But otherwise, uh, I put two, three weeks, but really it's two weeks. Uh, what I do is, after my, my EOS quarterlies, I, the, the VTO and the discussion of the quarterly prepares uh, and sets up um, the conversation for the board meeting. So basically, two weeks after, and why two weeks is that we take what we said in the, the, the quarterly, we prepare, package it up, make sure that the financials are out, and then a week before the quarterly, the, the board meeting, we send out the package. So, so it really gives us a week to prepare because we're, 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 we're at the end of the first week, we're sending out the board, the board package to have the board meeting the following week. And what we cover at the board meeting is hindsight and insight, oversight and foresight. And hindsight is really where we were, oversight is where, where are we at now and where are we going with foresight. And that's really the typical agenda of a board meeting is really understanding what happened in the past, like what did we learn from it? Uh, what, what does that mean for us now today? And then, you know, how are we gonna prepare for what uh, we wanna do in the future? And then, like I said, we identify, I, I wrote two rocks, it's one to two rocks, depending on the agenda and the conversation that we want. And that helps bring some leadership uh, individuals, uh, so some people in the leadership team to come and present their challenge for the next quarter and they could benefit from the contacts, the experience uh, of the board members. And basically seven days before, as I mentioned earlier, we send the board package with the agenda, the financials, minutes, legal update, rock presentations and so on. And I also send the EOS VTO as well. Mm -hmm. So with that process, uh, and we'll get into how EOS Worldwide sort of evolved into our process. And one of the things that we noticed, and I noticed this working with my clients who had boards, is that when we had our quarterly, we packaged it up, and then we would deliver it to the board, the board would have insights and input which would require changes to what we already agreed to as a leadership team. And that caused uh, issues, right? Because like, oh, well, we thought we were doing this and now we're doing that. And then the time difference between our quarterly and then our board meeting, people would jump in and start working on that. And then the board would say, we can't do this or we shouldn't do this or that. And, and we would have to go change it. And so that there was a couple weeks of wasted work. There's a couple weeks of um, 
we thought we were on the same page, but we weren't <laughs> because we had direction that was uh, opposite of, of what we agreed to as a leadership team, which is part of the reason why EOS and, and part of the reason we're having this exact conversation is that if you are not 100% on the same page with your board all along the way, there's a higher probability that the leadership team is going to decide on doing something that the board is not in agreement with. And that's going to cause some change. It's going to cause some disruption that you'd like to avoid. Oh, totally. Um, and, you know, what I'm seeing is often at the, at the annual meeting, basically when we do the annual um, EOS kickoff to two days, uh, they'll do it after the board meeting. The, 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 so basically the board will set the direction for the year. They'll pick that up and then, you know, be aligned with the board and start doing their two days based on, you know, the alignment that the board will give. That, that happens and you're at a much bigger level than you know, a, a lot of the companies because you're a quasi independent board. So you have a, a bigger board structure and a, a, a bigger shareholder structure and, and that's giving direction. Most companies in the US won't be at that level. They'll actually be on the board and also uh, in you know, uh, either visionary or integrator. So there'll be a, a stronger alignment but mm -hmm. as uh, as there's a detachment from uh, the the shareholders uh, and and the board members that are probably not all uh, in the operations, uh, th there needs to be a better alignment. And I see that happening usually at the annual at the annual kickoff. Mm -hmm. Makes is that, sense. Is that what you're seeing or, or? Yeah, no that 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 does that does make sense. Um... Yeah, that strong tie could be broken in um, lots of different ways too, which is, I think, a, just a topic for a different <laughs> uh, sure. podcast, meaning that that visionary doesn't necessarily agree with what his or her leadership team decided and then uses yeah. the board as a way to... Um, undo <laughs> yeah. without taking yeah. accountability for uh, the decision. Um, cool. There's All right. So let, yeah, right. Right. Um, so then the next step with the feedback loop and um, then we'll kind of go into some of the detail of how EOS works with yeah. the board. So, so, not with all, but with, with some, like, and again, a little bigger, and I'm interested in hearing from you. Mm -hmm. um, the, the chairman will meet with the visionary. So at times, the chairman and the visionary, actually, the chairman is always independent. That's my recommendation. It should be an independent person. But the chairman meets with the visionary, and I do that with a lot of the companies, and at times, the integrator, depending on how they want to do it, and provide feedback from uh, the recommendations, the board, and the direction that's set. So that's another way to get the alignment and making sure that the board and 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 the operations, the accountability chart are aligned. Uh, visionary or integrator will update the, the management team and address issues in IDS, if any, so that creates alignment and making sure that next quarter everybody's working in the same direction with the same uh, expectations. And management team uses feedback to continue uh, quarterly and annual EOS planning. So that's kind of how I do with my uh, my clients. I don't know how you're following following the board, how you're interacting with the chairman, or if that's happening or not. Yeah, we definitely have a really good feedback loop. And again, it took a little while to work into that feedback loop. So Kelly Knight and I meet with our chairman and one of the other owners every other week. And we create a IDS list. We IDS together. We get on the same page the best we possibly can. And we do that every two weeks. Then immediately post our board meeting, there's an executive session, and then we are brought into that executive session. And that's really the first feedback loop that gets started with the chairman right back to us. And um, 
it's a it's a pretty tight feedback loop. Good. So, Mark, you wrote you wrote, actually we started interacting following your blog post. Yeah. Uh, that you did uh, maybe about two months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I wrote back to you and saying, hey, this is amazing. I'm doing this with my clients. Let's talk. And yeah. that's why we're having this podcast today. Yeah. But uh, why don't you walk us through what, um, what you wrote a few weeks back, reference to how EOS works with a board. Yeah. So just to give some context to this, we had a pretty rough board meeting. We just weren't feeling on the same page. And it felt a little bit like we were just totally disconnected from the board, from our ownership. And we're like, all right, we just got to fix this. We, we can't operate this way. So I said, well, okay, let's dig in and find all of the points of failure in our current process. And Kelly and I felt that we are sort of stuck between our board and our leadership team, and we just weren't synced up. So how do we get them synced up? How do we get everyone on the same page and hold us there all the time? And so we experimented, uh, and almost immediately it worked. And what we did is the, the first thing is that prior to our board meeting, we get together with our leadership team and we say, okay, we're not, our rocks aren't due until our quarterly, which is going to be probably three weeks out. For next quarter, let's pencil in what our rocks will be, uh, most likely. Not 100%, just penciled in where our heads, what are our priorities, what are we working on. We review the VTO, we make sure that there's whatever updates we're gonna to have to the VTO, we're, we as a leadership team are 100% on the same page. So we record that. And what we do is then I walk the board through prior to the board meeting, what the team, where our heads are, how we're thinking, any proposed updates or changes to the strategy, to the VTO, or anything around that. And I just record it using just off the shelf recording software, walk the board through that. They get then a pre-read, they get all the videos. And so when we go into the board meeting, they already have all their questions prepared. They fully understand where everything is and they can really speak into and challenge where we are. We then firm up with the board, any tweaks or changes to those penciled in rocks, so forth and so on. Then we go to, so we conduct a board meeting. Then we have our quarterly or annual planning session with our leadership team. Now you would think <laughs> that this would make our sessions with our leadership team shorter because we've already set our rocks or gotten really close to them. We've already confirmed them with the board. But that's not the case. <laughs> they still take seven hours plus or minus one and we discuss and debate and we actually get to go a little bit deeper into what those rocks will look like in all practicality. So once we complete that quarterly or annual session, we do it EOS Pure um, with our implementer. When we are finished, if there's any tweaks or changes, I will then present back to the board via video a walkthrough of all the decisions that were made. And so the result of that video is everybody's 100% on the same page. Then we go into that sort of feedback loop where every, once a month I record a video giving updates and highlights on how our execution is going. And then we have our every two week meetings with our um, chairman and uh, owners. So that's, that's our process and that has worked really, really well on everybody is in the know at all times. Everyone is same page or at least working towards it uh, at all times throughout the, the process. And it is a lot of work. It's a, an additional, uh, like, hey, uh, I've got a 
create a video. I got to create my talking points. I got to fully understand even myself where everything is, which forces a little bit higher degree of rigor throughout the the process. And so that's what works for us. And I encourage anyone to sort of take that and modify it as they see fit. Um, the, the one thing with that is that what we end up getting is interesting conversations and interaction with our board members in between our board meetings because they're getting the monthly video updates and they're like, oh, I can help with this or I can help with that. And it really creates a, a container, it creates a structure where you're getting more value out of your board than just the board meeting. Uh, and so that, that's been our process and so far so good. How long has this process, process been going on? This has been going on for two years. Two years. And you talked about board members getting more involved or, or participating more. So, so is that a result of this process and, and the structure that you're bringing in? It is. And it's really about the video because board members are busy. They've got their, uh, you know, their full-time roles or businesses that they are running. And my videos are usually a, a little less than 20 minutes long. I try to keep them under 10. Uh, and then they can play them at 1.5 speed. So it takes it down to like 11 minutes, <laughs> seven to 11 minutes. And so they get a lot of information in a very dense, interactive way and they can immediately participate because of that. Amazing. Good. So, so the board, the board didn't exist before Firefly. So no. what, what impact have you seen or the contribution that you've seen uh, with the board coming, c coming as part of your process? So since Gino sold the business in 2018, it has grown eight or nine hundred percent since then and it has scaled to levels that probably wouldn't have happened um not saying that it wouldn't but gino knew that his where his container is in terms of startup to where we were um that was it and and kelly knight was the first employee ever and so I don't think we would have continued the growth that we were on and ha and are continued to be on without the input of the board. I will also say that we've also done a lot of experiments on, hey, what works, what doesn't work with the support of the board all along the way. And so while we don't execute perfectly, while we don't have perfect strategy all the time, they've facilitated experiments that some work, some don't, just like any other, but that's been super valuable to experience. So Mark, you started off and, and you know, uh, I heard you um, in saying that EOS wasn't built for boards, but yeah. even myself, when I was presenting, I, I, I listed a whole bunch of tools, but I'm even using more and, mm -hmm. and you kind of illustrated pretty much the same. Like, it sounds like a lot of the foundational tools of EOS are very much applicable to boards. And, you know, there's a continuity between EOS and, you know, engaging with a board or uh, an advisory board structure. Yeah, I, uh, that's the tools work for boards for sure. It wasn't designed for that. And it takes a little bit of creativity to apply it. It takes a little bit of experience to apply it and openness to apply that. And so I, I, I do think that we're just going to continue to see that uh, we've got, we typically work for founder led, visionary led organizations where the complexity is, like, yeah, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to deal with that. And so that that's really at the root of EOS and, and the tools. And when I make the statement, it wasn't built for boards because it wasn't, but it does work. Yeah. Yeah, it does work. And, and, you know, the other thing is board structures are new as well. You also mentioned that earlier. So yep. people are learning how to interact and, and build that proper structure to be able to uh, to leverage that. And it sounds like, you know, EOS has done an amazing job 
with the numbers you just quoted before. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, I think we have come to the end and I hope that we've given a ton of value to people who are considering the, the board structure, the advisory board structure, whatever type of structure you, you choose that's best for you where you are along your journey. And uh, I appreciate the time, Patrick, and I, uh, this is the first. So this is a little bit of an experiment. We're gonna just put this out in the world, see how people react to it, and we'll tweak and hone, refine the, the conversation as we move forward. It was a pleasure, Mark, and look forward to the next. All right, thank you very much, and we'll see you all until next time.